But the identification of a body is the specialist task of the forensic pathologist. And here in Los Angeles, they have the grim distinction of possessing the busiest forensic medical department in the world. Dr. Buckwin, please report to the floor. How are you? Incoming homicide. Dr. Robert Buckley, forensic pathologist at Los Angeles for many years, is probably one of the most experienced investigators in this field. To a person experienced in the examination of injuries, this is a particularly interesting case. Instead of having an adult human body to examine, we have images of the front of the body and of the back of the body. Both of these show injuries of various types on the body, all of which are shown in such detail and clarity that a forensic examination can be made. The body is that of an adult male, and the image as it appears here measures 5 feet 10 inches in length, and the estimated body weight is 175 pounds. The body appears to be about 30 to 35 years of age. On the body is a variety of injuries, ranging all the way from simple contusions to large areas of puncture where there has been an outflow of blood. The wounds can best be divided into five categories. The first group concerns injuries which appear on the back. These range from the top of the shoulders down to the areas of the calf. They consist of double puncture type wounds which appear to go in a direction from lateral toward medial and downward. They have obviously been made by some implement with sharp edges. And the implement was applied to the skin in a flicking fashion in such a way as to pull out bits of skin. Ve ne faccio vedere un tipo, uno dei tanti del, di quelli documentati. I will show you one type, one of the many documented, on which you can see the ends weighted with tachilli, as the Romans called them. These were heavy balls made of metal or bone. As you can see, this whip is divided into three parts, which, when applied, naturally multiplies the number of strokes. If we apply this to the photos of the shroud, for example to this one showing the calves, and if we put these small metal balls of identical size over it, you have a graphic documentation of the marks left by one of the strokes of the whip, and one only. On the left calf, they are the same size and from the same direction. Therefore, these two strokes were given by the same scourger. You can now see something even more disturbing by studying the shroud. There are trickles of blood caused by the metal balls which were sharpened. They had spikes at the ends. Applied to the life-size photograph, the proportions and measurements are identical. Complete examination of the holy shroud gives us two scourges because the directions converge, one from the right and one from the left, and the number of strokes is excessive, more than 120. Also present on the back image are two areas of abrasion located over the shoulder blades. These are caused by a heavy object resting across the back. Imaginate una trave che al tempo when talking of the cross of Jesus, imagine a beam that at the time of Pontius Pilate was put across the shoulders and tied on with a rope. Marks of this beam can be seen in the area of the left and upper right shoulder blades. These are contusions and lacerations from the scourging wounds, which spread under the weight of the beam. The second group of injuries are those which appear on the face and on the head. On the right cheek, over the malar area, is a swelling which has resulted in partial closing of the right eye. There is also an area on the nose where there is a separation and possible fracture of the nasal cartilage. On the tip of the nose is a small abrasion, possibly resulting from a fall where the nose came in contact with a hard object. His fall was unavoidable. 
and was one of the most common spectacles of those times. The consequences are very clear on the shroud. You can see the left and the right leg. The left leg at the kneecap has very bad laceration and contusion. It is evident that the left leg bent and hit against the stones. In the forehead and in the scalp is a series of blood stains, one of which has the configuration of a figure three. These appear not only on the front part of the forehead, but also on the back part of the scalp and high at the vertex of the head. They were made by sharp pointed objects which have projected below the skin and produced bleeding. Their configuration is such that the implement was like a cap which rested on the head. This wound, corresponding to a crown of thorns, probably more than any other, identifies the man as Jesus Christ. The Gospels state clearly that the soldiers invented this torture for him alone. It was certainly not normal Roman procedure. A forger would have included such wounds, but would have shown them, as all artists did, as a circlet. Instead, the whole head is covered, suggesting a rough clump of thorns. Almost certainly what actually happened. Yet one more graphic detail indicating the shroud's authenticity. The third group of injuries involve the area of the wrist and the forearms. In the left wrist is what appears to be a blood stain which has resulted from a puncture type wound of the left wrist. This stain has two divergent streams which extend downward. If the left arm is moved laterally to a position where these two divergent streams are vertical as a result of gravity, we have the position of the arm at the time of the flow of blood. The blood stains which appear on the forearms are also consistent with two angles of blood flow. An injury to this part of the wrist will invariably damage the median nerve, whose function is to flex the thumb across the palm. It's interesting to note that there are no thumbs in these images. The next group of injuries are those about the feet, and they can best be seen on the dorsal image. The imprint of the right foot is pretty clear, and the heel and the toe are well defined. The left foot is less well defined. The left heel is elevated higher than the right heel, suggesting that the left foot was on top of the right instep and that a single spike was used to impale the two feet together. Crucifixion took many different forms, each carefully designed to provide a slow, lingering death. The wounds on the shroud, particularly the blood flows on the arms, make it possible to accurately reconstruct the form of crucifixion used and illustrate the awful technical realities. Firstly, the nails pierced the wrists, which, contrary to the imagination of artists down the centuries, is the only place that will take the weight of a body. Suspended only by the arms, the victim would die much too quickly, probably within minutes of suffocation. So the feet have been nailed to provide the support necessary to extend the agony. The divergent streams of blood indicate two distinct positions. In the first, the weight is mainly on the wrists with the body slumped. In the second position, to avoid suffocation, some of the weight is transferred to the feet, raising the chest and altering the angle of the arms. Thus the victim was thrown from one excruciating pain to another until exhaustion overcame or the legs were broken. It is even possible to calculate the final position on the cross. The last of the injuries is an apparent wound to the side. Here, in addition to a large outflow of blood from the heart, there is also evidence of another thin, watery type substance, which is best seen on the dorsal image where blood has flowed across the lower part of the back and is separated from the heavier blood components. 
The markings on this image are so clear and so medically accurate that the pathological facts which they reflect concerning the suffering and death of the man depicted here are, in my opinion, beyond dispute.